it's quite an honor to be opening uh, this panel today. Uh, the topic we're discussing is Turkey, but I invite you to keep a global look as we discuss developments in Turkey. Uh, the context, the broader context, is the rise of authoritarian illiberalism worldwide. Uh, I think given what, what's happening in America, for one, um, it's clear that we're grappling with a worldwide phenomenon. So my role is to give a little bit of a wider context uh, to set the stage before handing over to the great panel we have today. Now, there's a few things that have to give us pause before we start. Uh, first is something that almost does not need mentioning, which is that we recognize that democracy is the goal. We recognize intuitively that democracy is the desirable form of government. Uh, the second is that we're calling this democratic erosion, the erosion of democracy, when in fact these figures that we're talking about, Erdogan or the other illiberals, are actually democratically elected. They rose to power through elections, judged to be free and fair. And yet it seems intuitive for us to call them authoritarian. Uh, it's intuitive to us to call this a de an erosion of democracy. It's almost as if we intuitively recognize something deeply alarming about their, ra their, ra their rhetoric, their narrative, their actions. Uh, we see that this behavior, the behavior we observe is not democratic behavior. In effect, we seem to intu intuitively recognize that democracy as a hardware alone is not enough. We seem to recognize that there is a software component. I'm, I'm a computer programmer by education, so you know I'm, I'm borrowing the, the, the metaphor. Uh, so we're talking about two different kinds of democracy. There's, a, there's liberal democracy, which has a proven track record in lifting people, uh, liberating people, giving them dignity, giving them equality, and delivering also uh, a modern society. But we also have an illiberal democracy, which is not only do we find it morally distasteful, but we also intuitively recognize it as unstable and unsustainable. It's 2017. It was actually 20 years ago that uh, American uh, author Fareed Zakaria wrote a piece, a paper actually, predicting the rise of illiberal democracy. This was 1997. The USSR had basically crashed. Uh, many countries who were pre previously under the Soviet banner, uh, they were going through their own democratic, uh, you know, democratic transition. And Zakaria was, in a way, he was the buzzkill who came across and said, you know, let's wait. There's some, you know, let's not get too excited. So he was warning about, he was kind of commenting about the spread of democracy to countries that don't have a strong liberal tradition. He was talking, at the time, he was talking about the former Yugoslavia, uh, parts of Latin America, Palestinian authorities, parts of Africa. In 2017, this seems to be a global problem, and Turkey seems to be a particular case in point. To be fair, we're also, we're also looking at a rise of illiberal democracy or illiberal authoritarians across the, wor the world, not only uh, outside the Western world, but in some Western countries as well. But the driver seems to be different. Uh, I recently wrote a piece for Afton Post and just came out two days ago, outlining that and offering a perspective. Ironically, the rise of illiberal democracy outside the Western world seems to be a consequence of socioeconomic success. Uh, over the past few decades, uh, a combination of economic reform and democracy has lifted millions of people who are previously outside the, the, the political system, lifted them into the middle class and uh, activated them as political agents. The problem is that these people, these millions, a lot of them were never actually liberalized. They were never actually convinced of liberalism. As it happens, one of the biggest threats to liberal democracy is illiberal voters. The bigger problem with the rise of the populists is that it's not only that they're illiberal, it's that they, they have a wide voter base. So we're talking about millions of voters who aren't liberal. In fact, to the average AKP uh, voter, the word liberal is a slur. Uh, and who does this remind you of? When directed at a person or a party or a media, liberal media, it's an insult. Liberalism is associated with an elite who are seen to be detached from the people uh, and actively working to suppress their agency and their will. Now, honestly, who does this, who does this remind you of? So this is what democratic erosion is. It's 
at heart, it's actually a an erosion of liberalism. Illiberal democracies are not only terrible places to live, especially if you're in the opposition or if you're in a minority, they're also inherently unsustainable. Uh, a textbook case is what happened in Russia since the fall of the Soviet Union and how Putin ended up, uh, you know, we went from a nascent promising kind of democracy to a competitive authoritarianism to what's looking more and more like an outright dictatorship. Uh, in 2014, uh, Larry Diamond wrote a paper titled, Is Democracy in Decline? This was three years ago. He noted the mechanisms. He was talking about how does this happen? The mechanism by which an illiberal democracy stops being a democracy altogether. And he noted three different steps, and I'm sure uh, there'll be a lot to comment on. First is that the executive branch expands. So we go, for example, in the, in the case of Turkey, we see a shift from a parliamentary system to a presidential system. Uh, in the case, we're, we're seeing it right now in, the, in, in America that there's an over-reliance on executive orders. There's always this, this space. The executive branch tries to make space for itself. Second, uh, opposition rights are trampled and pluralism is attacked. Third, free speech is assaulted under one guise of an, or another. And, uh, a lot of the time, free speech is actually assaulted without censorship. There's so many tools that authoritarians can use to assault free speech without actually passing censorship laws. Uh, this is the populist playbook. It's, it was used to great success by Putin, and now it's being used by Erdogan. The fact is that illiberal democracy is not sustainable. For democracy to be sustained and to prosper, it needs to be supported by a liberal political tradition, a liberal, liber, liberal political culture. And that culture has to be fed continuously by liberal, you know, by liberal intellectual tradition. Uh, the ideas of freedom of thought, freedom of faith, freedom of the press, freedom of association, freedom of movement, freedom of trade, uh, freedom of transaction, the freedom to practice your faith or the, pre to pr the freedom not to practice any faith, these need to be, they don't come for free. They need to be justified. They need to be advocated and protected. Democracy is the hardware, liberalism is the software. That software needs to be upgraded as the hardware changes, as society evolves, as times change. Uh, at this point, I think I've done my part to set the stage for, uh, to open the panel, and I look forward to what my colleagues would add. Uh, before I would pass it on to Thor, uh, I want to say a couple sentences about my project at Civita, and I'll be very brief, and I'll, I'll, I'll just use the same metaphor that I used. If democracy is the hardware and liberalism is the software, then I see my role as contributing to writing the Islamic edition of that software. Thank you. So with this, I'll give the floor to the next speaker. Tour, please. Thank you. So I'd like to start with a, with a quick story. Uh, the story is that the people of Turkey elected Erdogan and his AKP party, the Justice and Development Party, in 2002. He appealed to the long-suffering poor, and most especially he appealed to religious conservatives that had been discriminated against over and over and over again by the Turkish state, uh, in as much as Turkey very much uh, posits a, an idea of secularism. And so he promised to bring Turkey into uh, the new century with three main points. EU membership, economic development, and stopping discrimination against religious conservatives. Because, and I, I'm telling you a story right now, because of xenophobia, because of racism, Turkey was not allowed into the EU. Meanwhile, the corrupt military, always protecting the establishment and standing in the way of religious freedom, carefully plotted a coup a coup that was looking to turn Turkey back into a dictatorship. And so in July of 2016, a terrorist by the name of Fethullah Gulen uh, created this coup, launched it, but the Turkish people disagreed. They went on the streets, they came out to defend their leader and to defend democracy. They restored President Erdogan, who was almost assassinated. And currently there are many terrorist elements inside, operating inside Turkey that have been trying to destroy this very strong democracy. And President Erdogan has arrested 44,000 of them, detained 90,000 of these terrorists, and has thus saved Turkey. 
It's a very simple story. And the story is men in uniform and corrupt people trying to overthrow a government and wanting to subvert the people's power and plunge Turkey backward. That is the story that Turkey is spending tens of millions of dollars to spread around the world. It has hired international respected lawyers like Bob Amsterdam to push this story forward, and it has used every branch of government to promote this idea. Every dictatorship needs a big lie. Every dictatorship has used this device. Historically, it has been used to carry out the designs and to go strip away little by little every aspect of what remains of civil society and individual rights. Uh, the Nazis had the big lie. Fidel Castro had the big lie. In the case of Castro, it was that life under Batista was so unbearable that anything, anything is allowed to stop that from happening. The North Koreans have the big lie. The big lie is that the South invaded the North. And because the South wants to kill everyone in the North, it is perfectly acceptable for the dear leader to do anything he needs to do to protect us. In the case of Turkey, oh, by the way, Venezuela, uh, where I was born, also has the big lie. And the similarity with Turkey is astonishing. The similarity is there's a coup d'etat. There's always a coup d'etat. And we must stop the coup plotters. They are everywhere. And they are plotting every month. They are plotting a new coup. So arrest them. And if they are successful in portraying this story, it's, it's very easy for people to fall for it. You see, the reality tends to be a lot more complicated. It's very easy to tell the coup story in 30 seconds. In the case of Venezuela, it's uh, rich white people wanting to take all the oil and oppress the dark people. They, they have a coup d'etat to oppress the, the leader of the people. The people come out and save the leader, and we're all happily ever after. That didn't turn out very well for Venezuela, and it's not going to turn out very well for Turkey either. The reality is that Erdogan, like so many of these other leaders, was elected freely and fairly. In 2002, he became prime minister, and he has been elected, re-elected three times. When you look at the history of his regime, you can start charting the breakdown in rule of law and charting the breakdown of um, freedom of speech. Usually that tends to be the canary in the coal mine. Uh, at first, it was the AKP party uh, attempting to control using businesses as many media as they could. What did they do? They didn't go after all of the media. They went after piece by piece. So they would go after one media ownership organization, a holding company, because they didn't pay their taxes. And the people of Turkey would say, terrible people, they evaded taxes. They should have their, their, their company expropriated. And slowly, bit by bit, he either eliminated people in the free press from controlling and being able to carry out their businesses by, by confiscating, by taxing, by starting criminal investigations, um, or he would have his own um, business people buy the, that media. So the handwriting was on the wall in 2004 but nobody really noticed. And it was when he started going after the media. Um, then 2004, 2007 with Zaban newspaper, 2009, 2011, then became uh, the next step of what people who seek to create authoritarianism do, which is uh, to begin to attack the separation of powers, begin to eliminate judges, begin to fire judges, sack judges. In his own case, a corruption case against Erdogan in 2008, again and again and again, he got involved in a corruption case against him. The, 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 the biggest element that should have been screaming to everyone that something is very wrong is when he offered the intelligence services of Turkey total immunity. Syria has this as well. This allows the intelligence service to operate at any point and do anything inside the country, even if it's illegal, and be able to get away with it with complete immunity. This was in the spring of 2013 that this began. For someone like me, who's much more interested in, 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 in usually it's the small anecdotes. Uh, how many people here have, have um, read or have seen the movie Lord of the Rings? <laughs> okay. Um, much like democratically elected leaders in countries that I'm not going to mention, like the United States, um, <laughs> sometimes the leaders don't like criticism in the media. Some leaders will take to Twitter and say, I really don't like how that show is portraying me. I'm really <laughs> upset how they're making me look. You know, that's because they're thin-skinned. People with authoritarian tendencies tend to be very thin-skinned. They don't like criticism. Um, in the case of Erdogan, it started with a cartoon of him as a cat. <laughs> so he had that journalist have charges against him. Then this, this doctor in 2004 in, in Anatolia, 
he put up um, some photographs on Facebook where he compared Erdogan to Gollum. <laughs> Erdogan did not like this at all because this wasn't the only picture that they put. You know, they had another one of Erdogan like this, which, and you will see, of course, the remarkable resemblance. <laughs> People with dictatorial mentality don't like humor. Um, they're, they're, uh, th I in this particular case, the Gollum case, and he was, uh, this man was actually um, tried uh, two years of his life in a trial um, because he posted these pictures on Facebook. Um, that, to me, is the canary in the coal mine. That is just like, that's a dictatorship. Everything else is, is just a long, complicated story. Um, the people of, of, of Turkey, of course, uh, we're living through this. And like the people in so many of these other democracies that were a story has been sold to the West, um, they protested. And, and uh, uh, in, in a very big way, the, the protests were, were so grand and so extraordinary that in 2013, uh, we had here at the Oslo Freedom Forum, um, uh, across the street at the, at the uh, uh, Oslo Nye, we had um, a man by the name of Erdem Gunduz. Erdem is known as the standing man of Turkey. In a circumstance, and, and Norwegians will, will, will get this, when the power of the state controls all of the military and they control all of the violence, there's very little that the citizenry can do other than nonviolent action. So what he did was he stood in front of the sculpture of Kemal Ataturk in one of the main squares from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. every day. And of course, the government was like, well, what do we do? Do we beat him? Do we arrest him for this? Or do we just ignore it? Well, it swept across the country. Now, uh, Erdogan knew this. So what does he do? Along came the July 2016 coup, which has led to three months of a state of emergency and extended again in October. And just a few weeks ago, he extended again in a move that completely ignores the Turkish constitution. And that's how I'm going to conclude. The full uh, um, process of transformation from a democracy to a dictatorship is because uh, they have a constitution from 1982, and that constitution was put together by the generals, and the people of Turkey don't want that constitution. Uh, so he promised, I'm going to change the constitution, but one little thing. If the new constitution, which is going to be voted on in April of this year, if the new constitution passes, I am now eliminating the position of prime minister, and I will become the executive president. So with that, he will have fully transformed Turkey into um, what is a full dictatorship. Um, so I think that's all the time I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Th thank you, Tor. Uh, Fatma Betilferil, please, the floor is yours. Hi, alle sammen. Jeg ble bedt om å snakke litt om sosial... Oh, sorry. I have to speak English. <laughs> Uh, I've been asked to speak about social media's role in uh, Turkey. Uh, what I would like to say is that to start to talk about social media's behavior in Turkey, I was thinking maybe I should just start from the Emevits to uh, explain you why Turkey is in the situation we are uh, today. Uh, but that would take too long. Uh, if then I was thinking, starting from the Ottomans, that would also take too long. So I will shorten it down to uh, from the period of Tanzimat, which is uh, when the reforms started and Turkish, uh, Turkey become a republic. Uh, to understand Turkish people's behavior today, uh, it's very important to look at the beginning of time of uh, when Turkey was established. In Turkey, up to today, uh, people has been suppressed. Either government, which has come into power, has been finding an enemy. This is a culture in Turkey. This is Turkish culture. You always have to find an enemy to keep uh, control of the masses. The Kemalists, they suppressed the people who were religious. It was not uh, welcome with a headscarf or with anything which was uh, uh, considered to be religious. And you were not even intellectual if you were religious in Turkey. Uh, not that we uh, shouldn't criticize the uh, uh, 
Muslim mentality. I'm totally for a debate for that, but that, that's another issue. But when we talk about democracy, everyone should have equal rights. In Turkey, people has never experienced this. They have always had a great leader, uh, a man to worship, uh, and the superior Turk. This being the Turkish people's picture of democracy, actually. So uh, each time Turkey was feeling uh, they are losing uh, their country or their democracy, the figure of Atatürk was there very strongly for them, and anyone who was not Turkish or didn't like Atatürk was not welcome. In such a manner, they created oppositions which were growing in the silence, uh, like the Islamists we have in Turkey today. Uh, what they did actually by not allowing you know, uh, people to practice their cultures, their uh, languages, their cultures like Kurdish people, um, also Kurdish by the way, um, uh, they uh, created um, a, a much frustration which was not known uh, by uh, European people I can say. Well the Kurdish problem is uh, widely known but the uh, Muslim people who were, or religious people who were suppressed, they were not talked about because we had this fine secular state called Turkey, which was so modernized, which were uh, so European, but in the silent there were a movement growing which was going to be uh, today's Turkey. And that started with actually uh, Adnan Menderes, but uh, Menderes, he uh, got the uh, support of the religious people, but in the end he was uh, hanged, as you know. Uh, and then after a while the Turkish military's power has been very clear in Turkey up to uh, Turgut Özal, uh, the eighth president of Turkey, become uh, president and uh, prime minister in Turkey. And with him it softened a little bit, but still yet there was a lot, uh, there was a lot of issues which has to be solved in order to uh, create more, uh, um, create a more liberal society. But that didn't happen because we had Erbakan, which was the mentor of uh, Erdogan. He was in the race. He came to power, but he lost the power after a military, uh, well, kind of coup. Uh, and that created a lot of frustration in Turkish population, which is actually 99% Muslims. Uh, with like, um, uh, how was it? Uh, he was the savior um, uh, in the, uh, let's say, in the hidden sphere of Turkey. The Islamists they had started to establish um, uh, businesses. They had to start to become powerful uh, in economical sphere, and this also created uh, their power before they uh, they become. Um, uh, Refah Party, which is, uh, was Turkey's first uh, Islamic uh, political movement. Uh, well, uh, the frustration in the Islamic sphere of, pe of people of Turkey, which were quite underestimated, uh, uh, came into uh, the daily life, and we started to see uh, that they took their power from people's frustration. And as we see today, as also Iyad said, illiberal uh, powers, they bring illiberal uh, leaders. Uh, the thing is the lack of education, which is a main problem in whole world, uh, is not only related to Turkey, uh, it's related in not to the, uh, Turkey, but to the whole world. And people of um, Turkey, the voters who brought these people into power, they had very little education about democracy because if you look at the Turkish education system, you don't see much of uh, uh, subjects which is about teaching the children their basic rights, human rights, democracy, what's about. Actually, there is almost nothing like about Second World War, very little about First World War. The, the, what you see most of is Turkish inkılap tarihi, which is about how Atatürk established the uh, country, how uh, he came into power, how the great Turkish Republic was created, was born, but uh, about how democracy really functions in other countries, uh, in liberal countries, you don't see mu uh, almost nothing of it in Turkish education system. 
And this is the main core and the main problem of today's Turkey, that people, they don't know what democracy is. You can, you can tell them this uh, um, system is not legal, it's not li liberal, it's not democratic, it's not following the human rights, but it won't help because people doesn't have the base for understanding what real democracy is. And that's the biggest challenge today to make people uh, uh, mobilize for democracy on social media. Because what happens on social media in Turkey? Turkey, uh, 70 2% people, according to We Are Social, are using social media in Turkey. And their ages are between 25 and 55. This means almost 50% uh, of the Turkish uh, population. And they're using uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all the so social medias we know about. But what happens on social media is that people mobilize with like-minded. Okay, this is not also only for uh, Turkey, it's everywhere in the world we see today that the radicals, they mobilize with radicals, liberals mobilize with uh, liberals. But in Turkey's case, it can be a little bit uh, more difficult to mobilize people under the same uh, uh, movement. Because even though 50% are against uh, this uh, regime uh, which is now raising in Turkey, uh, within those 50%, it's so many different kind of mentalities which won't even say hi to each other if they knew what kind of uh, mentality the other one has on the street. So uh, I lived in Turkey for uh, five years from 2011 to 2016. I would put it like my husband says, hardware Turkish, software Norwegian. So uh, as a... As a Norwegian, when I went down to Turkey, for me, I thought I was very uh, Turkish. I had Turkish parents, whatever. But when I went down, I just saw that this is totally another planet for me. These people here, you can't tell them your opinions because you would immediately be put in a box. If they can't put you in a box, then they, they will be disturbed. Because in Turkey, there is no gray zones. I will... Um, uh, finish with this. The problem in Turkey is like here, we can be criticized, intellectual people can sit and discuss from very different uh, mindsets and they can agree, disagree, but in Turkey this is impossible. Everyone will say, I am the most right. And this doesn't create gray zones in Turkey. And this is a great challenge for Turkish democracy and for uh, being hopeful that uh, they, the Turkish people can demolish uh, this uh, regime which is in raise in Turkey today. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Kristine Kaplin. Please, the floor is yours. So I have been asked to talk about the legal status of the rule of law in Turkey and the Vigris Freedom Foundation. So let me start with a disclaimer. I am not a human rights lawyer, uh, nor a constitutional law lawyer. I am a business lawyer who thinks that we who live in privileged societies have to help and support those who fight by legal means to obtain the rights that we take for granted. The Leaders Freedom Foundation is a foundation that supports and part funds legal aid to women who, if convicted, will be prisoners of conscience. It supports women human rights defenders who have neither used nor advocated illicit violence. The basis for the Leaders Freedom Foundation is Article 10 in the UN Human Rights Declaration, which states that everyone is entitled in full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal. When the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN in 1948, no country voted against it. So the Vigdis Freedom Foundation believes that the necessary condition for achieving a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal is the right to be represented by legal counsel of own choice. This is why we also support the defense lawyers in order to reduce the personal and financial risk that the lawyer may face when taking on what can be, what is usually a contentious legal case. 
In Turkey, the Vigdis Buryan Foundation supports human rights lawyer Erin Keskin, uh, who after the failed coup is facing approximately 160 charges related to freedom of expression. She is a human rights lawyer and she has also been the editor of a newspaper, Now Closed. One of the charges against her for which she is sentenced but prison ha uh, but she has a, to prison but she has appealed is for having said that there was a, uh, an Armenian genocide in 1915 and that the Turkish army killed an 11-year-old boy, uh, both undisputable facts. Um, she has been offered political asylum in France, but she loves Turkey and she wants to stay and fight for freedom of expression in Turkey. She has also seen too many of her friends die and be tortured in prison, so she feels solidarity with them. Between September and December 2016, I have traveled four times to Turkey, meeting with lawyers, professors of law and observing court hearings. So my knowledge of the uh, rule of law situation in Turkey is the result of these trips and publicly available information. So as for the basis of the rule of law, I mean the, the, the leading authority is Lord Bingham, Bingham who has defined some sub-rules, uh, some of which are the law must be accessible, clear and predictable. Questions of legal rights and liability should be resolved by application of the law and not the exercise of discretion. The law should apply e equally to all except for the, uh, to the extent that, objectives different, uh, that objective differences sh uh, justify differentiation. The law must afford adequate protection of human, uh, human rights. Judicial and other adjudicative procedures must be fair and independent. And there must be compliance by the state of its international law obligations. I agree with Tor. Uh, Turkey is now violating all the major principles of rule of law and international obligations. I will sustab substantiate this opinion by, the by opinions issued by the Menes Commission and statements and facts provided by reliable sources and Turkish official statements. Turkey is a founding member of the Council of Europe. The Venice Commission is the advisory board of the Council of Europe. It is composed of independent experts in the field of constitutional law. It is a highly respected committee, and Norway's representative is Professor at Law, uh, Dr. Jan Helgesen. The Commission's full name uh, is the European Commission for Democracy Through Law. Three major opinions were rendered by the Venice Commission in 2016, all criticizing the recent developments in Turkey. The first opinion is on the suspension of parts of Article 83 of the Turkish Constitution that guarantees parliamentary immunity. The Venice Commission considers that this change encroaches on the freedom of parliamentary debate and is a misuse of the constitutional amendment procedure. The second opinion is on the emergency regime introduced in 2016. Uh, the original introduction is accepted by the Venice Commission, but the regime gave increased powers to precedent due to the emergency situation. The Commission finds that the measures taken by the government are excessive. In particular, the Commission expressed concern that the government is allowed to legislate without any, any control of Parliament or by the Constitutional Court and that it conducts a purge of state employees, which raises serious human rights concerns. After the Venice Commission rendered this opinion, the state of emergency has been prolonged for the third time. Uh, the third opinion on Turkey is concerned to the curfew measures imposed in the southern eastern part of Turkey, that is the Kurdish areas. The Venice Commission finds that the curfew measures did not meet the requirements of legality enshrined in the Turkish constitution and resulting from Turkish international obligations in the area of fundamental rights. Moreover, Erdogan has now started a process of constitutional reforms in order for him to become the sole executive power of Turkey. Many factors indicate that also these proposed reforms are conflict with the Turkish constitution. The reforms passed the Turkish parliament in January 20, uh, 2011, no, 2017, last month. Um, at that time, parliamentary immunity had been taken away and 11 democratically elected MPs had been arrested. A referendum of the reform is necessary and scheduled for a April 2017. Uh, Previously, it has been assumed that the referendum would not take place before the state of emergency was lifted. 
President Erdogan announced that he will be on tour for a yes campaign. The Prime Minister has stated, we will have a nice campaign in cooperation with the President. However, according to the Turkish Constitution, currently effective, the President must remain impartial, which obviously he's not. So when the executive power overstep their limitation, one can hope for the judges to consider cases independently. In June and July 2015, a year and a half ago, um, there was a systematic purge of judges. Judges and prosecutors that were not loyal to the government were arrested, suspended, dismissed or moved against their will to service in the countryside. Measures were taken against approximately 3,000 judges and prosecutors. This includes measures against all the judges that of the, um, involved in the investigation of corruption uh, against members of government and their families. That was what Tour talked about. In addition, judges that freed the journalists from prison were arrested themselves and had their decisions not effectuated. After the 15th of July, 3,456 judges and prosecutors have been dismissed and over 800 are arrested. Together, there are approximately 7,000 judges and prosecutors in Turkey. So 3,000 plus 3,456, I guess you can do the maths yourself. I attended a trial in December in Istanbul. They told me that there was a new judge on the tribunal. Two weeks earlier, the police had come into the courtroom and pulled out one of the judges. The European Network of Court Commissions has declared that Turkey's Court Commission no longer upholds principles of independence. The result is that judges in Turkish render the decision that they are instructed to. Standard procedure seems now to be that before giving a decision, the judges take a break and call Ankara to verify that they rendered the correct decision. So therefore, it is unlikely that there will be a so-called judge in Turkey that can have the courage to render independent decision. The decree laws issued without parliamentary uh, approval and during the state of emergency also provide for prosecutors with the right to record conversations between lawyers and clients, court hearings to proceed without the defendant present, the deadline for three months to complete administri uh, admi investigations has been suspended, and there is no legal responsibility for public officials for acts undertaken during the state of emergency. Consequently, uh, allegations of tortures are systematically dismissed. Uh, the president of the Turkish Bar Association has said, we the Turkish Union of the Bar Association warned our citizens with the clear and imminent danger caused by the situation into which we have been led. We invite the president and political leaderships to respect rules of law that have attained universality and to put an end to the tension in society. The president of the Progressive Lawyers Association has addressed torture and rape in the same meeting. The policemen, prosecutors and judges and soldiers that are deemed parallel state members are systematically tortured. Those who pray together at the courtroom's praying room rape these people in the prisons. They rip their nails off at the security directorate. I have seen people who went through bowl operations because of the things that penetrated their anus. The Turkish government has postponed the visit of the UN Rapporteur on torture indefinitely and Erdogan has stated that all who regard themselves as victims are traitors. Um, so Turkey is a signatory to the European Convention of Human Rights and citizens can appeal. Turkey is, uh, is um, convicted the second uh, most times in the European Court of Justice, surpassed only by Russia. And I can't go through all the details because I have a little notice now that there's two minutes left uh, and it came a minute ago. Um, anyway, there is now established a commission in Turkey that is to go because you cannot appeal before you have exhausted national possibilities of appealing. So now there is a new committee established in Turkey uh, that is uh, supposed to be worked for three years. There are seven uh, members, three appointed by the Prime Minister, one by the Minister of Justice, and one by the Minister of Internal Affairs, and one by the Higher Council of Judges and Prosecutors. It's estimated that they will have 100,000 cases to look at in a period of time span of two years. This means deciding the fate for 250 people every day. And the maths, um, two minutes for every case. 
Uh, so those who are accused don't always know what their crime is. Actions were legal when committed and have become illegal in retrospect. Sanar Yudatantsman's defense statement in January 2017, he was sentenced to one, uh, more than a year of prison. He said, I don't know what I'm supposed to defend. So finally, Shakespeare's King Lear is becoming true in Turkey. You know, King Lear, he said, first let's kill all the lawyers. This is when he wants the, the state to go down. No freedom of speech, no freedom of thought, no separation of power, no rule of law. I have not spoken about the arbiter closing of private business or, conf or confiscation of funds. Uh, the constitution of Turkey is being remodeled against the provisions of the constitution and in the political climate of fear. The Turkish people are scared. I even have problems finding a translator when I, for a hearing I'm due to observe this week. So summing up, just think about this. People don't have the right for a fair and public hearing. If you don't know what you have done, that's criminal. It's probably because yesterday it was legal. You expect that the judge is impartial, but he's scared to render an independent uh, judgment. You are so lucky to have a lawyer. He risks to be imprisonment and torture because he defends you. When an international observation, such as tiny, tiny little vigorous freedom confrontation steps in, the translator is so afraid that they back out, scared of the consequences. So, thank you.